Hello again, everyone, and welcome back to The Underground. This is the briefing for Friday, the 24th of September, 2021, and it is being recorded the day prior on the 23rd of September. Just a quick note before we get going, uh, we've noticed that for some reason, uh, YouTube is now recommending these videos to people who have never even heard of us before, uh, even though we've been doing these Intel briefings for quite a while now. Uh, so for those of you who aren't uh, aware of who we are and what we do and stuff like that, you can check out the rest of our channel and kind of get a feel for what we do. Uh, but when it comes to specifically these types of briefings, a, a good uh, distinction to make is the difference between intelligence and journalism. So what we're doing here is not journalism, uh, even though a lot of times if we don't have an analysis, we'll take the journalistic approach and just tell you what happened. Uh, but if you're looking to see the difference between what we do here and what journalism is, uh, check out our brief from the 12th of September, and that should give you a good, uh, just, just the first few minutes of that video, should give you a good understanding of how and why we're approaching things the way we are. So welcome to everyone who is new, and thank you for watching, and let's get right to it with the weather. For the next 12 hours, most of the significant weather in the country is going to be in New England. The northeastern states are going to get hammered with all different kinds of weather systems as they stack up and create all kinds of turbulence and things like that. Again, we have specific reasons why we're talking about this kind of weather, just to get people in the mindset of seeing it, because weather is a huge part of intelligence as a whole. So like I mentioned, most of the American Northeast is going to have very low cloud ceilings, cloud layers that are very thick and very low to the ground, which means that it's going to be very bad for any kind of visual surveillance, either with normal electro-optical sensors or FLIR type sensors, again, if there was anything, right? Again, not saying that there is, I'm just saying that that would be a good idea to get in the mindset of understanding. And like I mentioned, really throughout the rest of the country for the next 18 hours, pushing out that far, again, some of the mid-Atlantic coastal regions right there are going to have a, a lot of uh, significant cloud layers, all the way from very low levels all the way up to the very highest levels of the atmosphere. Uh, so that's going to be a, a huge uh, barrier for any kind of surveillance, again, if it were there. We're also going to see some pretty significant cloud ducts over the Dakotas and other parts of the Midwest, uh, mostly along the northern border there as well as off the California coast and parts of Florida. Moving into NOTAMs, uh, actually it's been kind of interesting for NOTAMs. There's one specific one that's very interesting. I'll go ahead and skip over it for now and go right to number two. Uh, the, other, the only other one that to be of note is uh, one that hasn't gone hot yet. Uh, it is for Camp David. So, of course, for those of you who don't know, uh, pretty much every single weekend that we've been following, uh, President Biden takes a vacation trip to either his home or to Camp David. It looks like this weekend it's going to be to Camp David. Um, it hasn't been announced to be the White House yet, but the NOTAM's there, so it's most likely going to occur. And for the one that's really interesting is the one for New York. So for those of you who don't know, the United Nations General Assembly is convening at the UN headquarters in New York, and they have a couple of NOTAM's uh, set up to prevent aircraft from, from getting near uh, those proceedings. And a couple of days ago, uh, there was an incident in which a small, uh, light Cessna aircraft uh, got close to the General Assembly uh, NOTAM area. Now, here's the interesting part. The aircraft is actually a West Point aircraft. It's one of the Cessnas they use for uh, teaching classes. In this case, it was an engineering class that uh, went up and was just following the river down uh, just to be a part of the curriculum there. Uh, there's no sensors on board. It has nothing to do with any kind of surveillance. We've we've uh, researched this aircraft, this particular airframe, quite heavily. It's it's just a teaching aid. Uh, but it's interesting because everyone, a lot of media sites are uh, saying that they breached the airspace. Well, they actually didn't. They didn't even come close. So here is a map of the the area. Uh, it shows the United Nations headquarters right there. Of course, the NOTAM is not centered over the UNHQ. Uh, just for OPSEC reasons, the FAA does not put the NOTAM directly over the building that they're trying to keep people away from. Uh, but everybody knows where the UN headquarters is. It's a very prominent building uh, on the skyline there. So that's where it's located. And those two rings uh, depict the two different NOTAMs. 
Uh, and this depicts the flight of the aircraft. So as you can see, it flew south along the river uh, and then turned around once it got to the George Washington Bridge. It got turned around because it got intercepted by uh, F-16s as part of you know, our national defense strategy and things like that. So a lot of people are saying that, hey, this aircraft you know, temporarily breached the airspace. Well, we can't find where it did uh, unless we are unless we're missing something or some kind of NOTAM popped up that we didn't see, they didn't even come close. Uh, sure, it makes sense as to why the F-16s and the military would scramble to intercept a small plane like that, especially if it wasn't a pre-filed -pre flight plan. Uh, but also, like, these guys didn't really get close. They didn't breach the airspace. They got close. So, um, again, it's kind of interesting that to see like how this stuff shakes out and everything, but it also goes to show that you don't have to necessarily be within a NOTAM to have an F-16 off your wing, which is interesting to take note. So that's why I wanted to talk about it today. So let's move into the civil unrest forecast. Really no major changes. The only one I did want to briefly mention is New York City. Uh, there, <laughs> we're starting to see a lot of cultural changes when it comes to the uh, medical mandates in the city, particularly the medical passports. So we're starting to see BLM uh, as an organization get spun up to um, oppose uh, medical passports due to their organ that organization's concerns and sort of social issues, right? So uh, BLM saying that it's a social issue now, and we're starting to see that get off the ground. I'm not entirely sure how that's going to go down. There was a big incident at a restaurant in New York City. You can look up for yourself, uh, but there was a big incident there where a, a restaurant hostess re you know, requested to see someone's passport, and they took it racially, and uh, there was a big fight. Uh, you could see the video. Uh, I can't show the video here, of course, because we'll get censored. But um, I don't want to really talk so much about that specific incident. But ju I just wanted to highlight briefly that we might be starting to see New York City, specifically since the mandates are so harsh there when it comes to uh, dining, uh, dining facilities, we might start seeing New York City be a point of solidification for a lot of these resistance efforts. And we might start seeing these resistance efforts come from groups that don't normally, we wouldn't think to see, right? If that makes sense. But we can talk a little bit about that later. But let's push into logistics and um, really just a quick rundown of the shortages from last time. Uh, really, there have been shortages of school bus drivers in a lot of states. Uh, water shortage out west is continuing. That's just an enduring thing that's going to be on the slide until, until the winter gets in and we start seeing the water levels rise again. Also, microchip shortage getting worse by the day. Uh, more and more auto manufacturers are coming out and saying they're shutting down plants or they're reducing hours or they're discontinuing vehicles. Uh, and really, the only two new additions for this cycle, this brief, uh, is... Uh, in North Carolina, specifically Winston-Salem, the town of Winston-Salem has declared that they have a bus driver shortage for public transit, uh, and they have shut down 14 different bus routes as a, as a result of this. Now, I do want to highlight, I, I didn't really drill down into each specific state in every little local newspaper. Uh, this one just happened to get picked up by a, a larger source, but I have seen, uh, just scrolling around the internet for a little bit, a lot of different other cities and localities reporting the same thing. So even though we only have the icon for North Carolina, that's the only place we can you know, say, hey, there's tangible shortages uh, causing routes to be canceled, this is affecting other states as well. I would probably venture to guess that the public transit bus driver shortage is very similar to the school bus driver shortage. It's a similar idea behind it. And also when it comes to the state of Iowa, I did want to point out uh, grains. So uh, I'm going to talk about this more on the critical infrastructure slide, but I did just want to point out that there has been a cyber attack that has uh, that is going to potentially affect as much as 40% of the nation's grain supply. So I'll touch on that here in just a second, but I just wanted to highlight that's that's what we've got going on for the logistics map for this time. So moving to the critical infrastructure concerns, uh, really the first one there is kind of the odd man out. I didn't want to, I didn't know where else to put it. So uh, Chantix, the drug Chantix has been recalled uh, by Pfizer because it turns out it may have uh, chemicals in it that cause cancer. So that has been recalled. Uh, the recalls are widening uh, with every day that goes by. 
And uh, yeah, it's just one more thing to, to be aware of because it's a pretty widely used uh, smoking cessation drug. And switching gears there to number two, the Port of Los Angeles is currently facing severe, severe congestion. Uh, as you can see by the image here, there are a lot of ships waiting to offload cargo uh, in the Los Angeles port region, with some ships waiting uh, an average of eight days or so to unload their cargo. Actually, we can see if we pull up the recent report by the Port of Los Angeles, we can see that they are most certainly over capacity when it comes to the amounts of cargo that they're processing. So for those that don't understand why this port is being congested, it's really due to things like social distancing, equipment cleaning, daily screenings of staff. Uh, this eats up a lot of time and the extremely strict social distancing rules uh, that the Port of Los Angeles has instituted for all their workers res have resulted in a lot of inefficiencies, right? They're just not able to work as fast uh, or, or as uh, widespread, right? So this is combined with an increase in demand for overseas goods results in a lot of delays. A lot of people who don't quite understand how various logistical networks here function in the U.S. might say something like, well, I don't see how demand could be up. Wouldn't it go back to the same level that it was before the lockdowns? And the answer to that is no. Uh, firstly, demand is always going steadily up all the time. Uh, even if it's going up just a little bit, it's, it, demand for things is for consumer goods is really never going down that much. Even if demand goes down due to an external factor like lockdowns, right, that demand is not going to go back to where it was before the lockdowns. It's going to go to the level that it would have been at had the lockdowns not happened, if that makes sense. Also, during the lockdowns last year, a lot of people and companies specifically put off things like unnecessary expenditures or repairs, stuff that wasn't really an emergency because of, well, one, social distancing rules closing stores, but also the reduced income that almost every business suffered from. They just didn't have the money to do repairs and, and expand their businesses, right? Well, now that things are picking back up, the demand for a steady stream of logistics is skyrocketing. Demand which our infrastructure cannot handle, thus the delays. Moving to number three, this is a developing situation that uh, we're, we just became aware of uh, this morning, or actually last night. The data management company, really it's a, a an agricultural co-op, an agricultural cooperative called uh, New Cooperative or NEW Cooperative, uh, was hit with a cyber attack uh, that was conducted allegedly by uh, the group Dark Matter. Uh, which is significantly threatening the U.S. food supply because the software systems that this group uses, this co-op uses, uh, affects dozens of different farmers uh, throughout the state of Iowa, but really it affects a lot of people beyond their borders as well because this software is used and responsible for managing the various agricultural systems of roughly 40% of farmers that produce our national grain supply. So this is kind of a shocker. Uh, this is one of those things where it's really hard to research. We can't really confirm uh, if this 40% of the national grain supply is, is, is in like direct harm. Uh, really, here are the things that Dark Matters is trying to, uh, trying to extort. You can see the list right there, just financial information, uh, all kinds of internal employee documents and things like that. So it's not necessarily a, it's a ransomware attack. So they're holding their data hostage, but they can't access it, right? So that's a problem because even though it's a ransomware attack, you think, okay, well, how can leaking some employee documents, you know, damage national security? Well, if these farmers can't use, if this co-op can't use its software and the farmers that use their software can't use it, then that's a huge problem. So uh, these screenshots were leaked uh, by a cybersecurity group that is working the issue. And uh, in which case, uh, this is a communication between the uh, hackers and the uh, actual company, the cooperative. And as you can see, it, it doesn't look to be super great. So like I mentioned on our logistics slide, this could have some very, very, very serious impacts as we move forward into the winter uh, when it when it comes to our national food supply, uh, now I don't want to you know scream the sky is falling just quite yet. Uh, we don't know how this is all going to work out. They 
could pay the fine like the FBI has been encouraging companies to do. And just, you know, they're, they're, uh, I think the, the ransom is up to $5.9 million or something like that. Um, it's changed a couple of times. So that's why I can't remember the actual dollar amount they're asking, but it's not an insignificant amount. But yeah, the longer that this goes on, the, the larger uh, impact this is going to have. Also, this highlights every single one of these high, uh, these cyber attacks that happens highlights to us um, the feeling of really every time I get one of these in my inbox, I think, wait a minute, this wasn't compartmentalized. Like, wait a minute, we, th this this can happen in the first place. So yeah, even for people like us uh, who have been following the national security and and national defense infrastructure kind of field, you know that boring stuff that nobody likes to track, like you know nuclear security, grain silo security, you know the security at water plant, uh, water purification plants, and stuff like that. Uh, even though we've been following this for a while now, it never ceases to amaze us how backwards things are when it comes to vulnerabilities. The fact that this kind of stuff can happen, the fact that you can simply hack a company which manages software for all different kinds of agricultural ventures, and it just so happens that they have merged so many times that they're now a significant portion of our national food supply. Yeah, it seems like nobody was really thinking about this from the cybersecurity realm, uh, which is a lesson that not a lot of industries are learning right now, even though they should be. And sort of in a similar vein, it has become public knowledge that the FBI secretly had the decryption key for the ransomware attack that was launched against the Casilla Group back in July. This was the cyber attack that took as many as 1,500 businesses uh, that defined as critical infrastructure offline. Well, it turns out that the FBI had the decryption key very early on during the several weeks long cyber attack and chose not to release it to the victims which many cybersecurity experts say was a very poor move. Understandably, in the world of law enforcement, to catch the bad guys, deception is required, and sometimes things need to be done that seem counterproductive, like withholding a password, right? But in the end, will result in capturing the culprits. However, cybersecurity experts say that this is not what happened at all. Eric Cron of the cybersecurity firm No Before stated that, quote, the FBI had the means and ability to assist by simply sharing a digital key, but chose not to, a decision that had no bearing on the activity from the Revel Group and gained them nothing in return. This was not a case of the FBI being unable to help due to a lack of staffing or any other reason, but the simple sharing of a digital key to the victim organizations." End quote. Now, I do want to touch on what everyone is thinking. This is one of those gut-level assessments that has absolutely no solid evidence to support it, but anyone who is aware of what the FBI does and what they've been up to the past few years and how political that particular agency has become at the senior levels, it's a gut assessment to think, all right, the FBI had the key because they're probably in on it somehow. Again, nobody is going to have enough proof to say that this was the case, and this is one of those ideas that can be easily legitimately explained away. Because if the FBI was doing their job, like if they were doing good and they were doing their job, of course they would have the key. Like, who else would you expect to have it? The guy running the hot dog cart outside? No, the exact same people within the FBI that have the capabilities to launch this attack or collaborate with the attackers are also the exact same people that we should expect to have the decryption key by doing their job and tackling the bad guys. So it's a really tough thing to go down the rabbit hole on because of the nature of this relationship. So again, I did just want to point out this line of thinking because we know a lot of people are thinking it, and even we ourselves don't have enough information to make an assessment either way. And honestly, at the end of the day, for the average American, it doesn't really matter who committed these cyber attacks. A Russian hacking group or the FBI themselves, it doesn't really matter because both groups have pretty much the same likelihood of being prosecuted, which is zero. So really, we're not so much concerned with the finger pointing as we are concerned about the impact to the average American. And all of these cyber attacks highlight just how vulnerable that average American really is.
Moving forward into significant governmental actions, uh, first one being uh, what's being called FedFest 21 on a lot of social media. This was the Justice for J6 rally, uh, which even people like Donald Trump said was a setup. I find it hard to believe that federal agents are that bad at being undercover, but a lot of the photos that have been circulating around, uh, you know, uh, of people that I don't know if they're federal agents or not, but uh, they seem to be very... uh, very sketchy. Like you can look at this person and they, they look, everyone who was there at the protest looked like either a reporter or, or an undercover cop. So, um, very interesting. And it just turns out that there was one guy who was detained for, uh, having a weapon on him and it turned out he was an undercover, uh, undercover agent. So there you go on that. Very interesting. Moving on to number two. Uh, this is one of those headlines that's so scary sounding that you have to research it to find out if it's real or not. But it's definitely real. Uh, Researchers are trying to figure out ways to use plants, uh, specifically plants like lettuce, to grow mRNA medical substances, you know, that magic, you know, V word we can't say on YouTube, uh, that a person would just eat instead of taking a shot in the arm. Again, this is one of those headlines that's so dystopian sounding that you just want to scream because we can clearly see the path this will take. But to keep things in perspective, uh, remember, it took forever to develop the shots that we already have and just look at their effectiveness, right? And also, this is a long shot. Um, a lot of people look at a university and they see the funding they're getting for researching stuff and they, they go into panic mode because they don't quite understand how long research takes. Now, of course, we can go down the rabbit hole of, of realizing that not a whole lot of true research is done these days and a lot of stuff is rushed, but... This will still take years to do. We're talking about something that has never been done before, and it's a lot easier than just manufacturing some kind of substance. We're talking about getting a plant to grow it. That's a little little bit different, a little bit more difficult. So yeah, this is going to take years, and uh, a half a million dollars, which is the size of the grant that the National Science Foundation gave for this uh, research, that's just a drop in the bucket when it comes to the funding that's going to be required for this kind of technology, if it's even possible. So to give as many perspectives as possible, this could just be a case of a researcher who needs to publish research and chose this research area because it's politically motivated and it's a great way to get money to buy shiny new lab equipment and at the same time publish research that won't be held to the same standards as other research because science, right, concerning this topic cannot be questioned under the current political narrative that has taken root in the medical and science field. So, again, we don't know what this is. It could be extremely nefarious. It could not be that nefarious, or it might not be that much of a legitimate concern. But I just wanted to point it out because this is the kind of stuff that we're keeping an eye on. Moving on to number three, uh, what's being known as the FBI safe deposit box theft. Uh, The FBI is just now starting to dig itself out of a hole they dug with a raid they conducted back in March. So the FBI raided a private safe deposit box company called U.S. Private Vaults, which is located in Beverly Hills, uh, on the accusations of conspiracies to break federal laws. During this raid, they opened and seized the contents of over 396 safe deposit boxes. But here's the deal. The attorneys for the people whose property was taken states that the warrant for that search specifically prohibited the FBI from opening safe deposit boxes. The warrant was just to search the business headquarters and had nothing to do with the safe deposit boxes. So it seems like it was more or less illegitimate right to start with. And once the FBI realized their either mistake or intentional theft, Uh, once they realized that these people had not committed any crimes whatsoever, they still petitioned the courts to be able to keep the money that they themselves admitted was illegally seized. So several federal judges throughout California have gotten involved with this uh, over the past few months and have ruled against the FBI at every step. So the FBI has been trying to cover up this scandal by stating that they will immediately return the property that they stole, but they have been slow about doing it. Uh, Several of the victims have reported that the FBI says they're going to return their property and the money, but they haven't yet, which is in clear violation of several court orders at this point. Moving on to number four with the Duckonomy card. I'm not sure how you pronounce it or not, but this is, uh, again... 
uh, something that is rapidly concerning if you just read the headline and you don't do any research. But this is a relatively new credit card company, uh, which was only started up a, a couple of years ago. Uh, and it didn't get much traction then because it's definitely a radical idea. So here's what it is. The idea behind this credit card is that the company that issues it will track your purchases and compare everything you buy. Once they notice a charge on the card, they will compare that to a database of carbon emissions for each of each item that you buy, which is then converted to a sort of points system. And when you hit your limit, when you use up your carbon points, you can't use that card anymore. They will shut it off. As of right now, this card is completely voluntary, and the kind of the main selling point for this card is that it is a good virtue signaling platform and a great way for people to quite literally put their money where their mouth is when it comes to climate change. Now, also, chances are if you're even watching this video in the first place, you can probably guess what our assessment of this is going to be. This card is also obviously a great way to influence culture and promote a kind of social credit system, which even though it's kind of a voluntary thing right now, it's pretty obvious that this would be an outstanding tool used to control people at, you know, years down the line or months down the line, however long it takes, right? And if we look back in time, since banks like Bank of America and Citigroup have already been observed uh, to be collaborating with the federal government to try to report customers' gun purchases to federal authorities, which is a reference to a scandal from a few years ago, uh, this is not a huge leap to assess that this kind of thing will become a problem in the very near future. Started out as a voluntary virtue signaling thing and then, and then start offering incentives to keep people engaging with these financial institutions until they get enough of a foothold in the political leadership's pockets to mandate these restrictions. Yeah, that's quite the rabbit hole to go down, but looking at things from a strategic view, like looking at the way the world is going, years down the road, this kind of economic warfare will certainly gain a lot of traction over the next few years. Again, we don't think that Visa is going to cut off anyone's credit card tomorrow when they try to buy one too many lattes, but this is absolutely something that is desperately important to keep an eye on, but it's such a boring topic that most people simply won't. And then number five, uh, Facebook is back in the news again uh, because they are launching a multi-platform effort to improve their poor public image, specifically the image of Mark Zuckerberg. And this program is called Project Amplify. Uh, this program was personally approved by Zuckerberg back in January and involves using Facebook's algorithms and their censorship tools to push more pro-Facebook posts to everyone's feed. So essentially what this is, is Facebook pushing propaganda about itself in everyone's news feed so that people get a better image of Facebook. To us, this is really just even more proof that Facebook is becoming increasingly more open about their politics and their censorship, which is interesting if you look at it from an analytical standpoint. Facebook has had dozens of scandals over the past year alone that would have been enough to sink any other company, but since they control a huge portion of the information flowing to everyday Americans, people don't see it. They don't see the shelved reports or the White House overtly stating that they are ordering Facebook to remove certain posts or the now blatant censorship efforts, which sound crazy, I will admit, but it's freely available and openly admitted to by Facebook. So yeah, social media proves once again how much control it has over the flow of information in the world. Which... Moving on to the K-12 through mask mandate tracker. Uh, so really the biggest changes uh, this week are the kind of walking back of the mask mandate bans for a few states. So for instance, uh, Texas, the Texas Supreme Court, they declined to enforce the mask mandate ban. So if an entity in Texas, like a public school district, wanted to mandate masks for public school attendance, the Supreme Court would say, yeah, that's, that's fine. So Texas has taken a step back, so we've created an additional category for their mask mandates being overturned. And also the states of Arkansas, Iowa, and Florida. In those states, a federal judge has temporarily blocked the mask mandate ban. So it's not that they're mandating masks, it's that they are banning the ban, if that makes sense. This is really confusing stuff. 
Moving on to the actual jab mandates, really there's only one school district in the United States that is still, that is that is mandating the jab for their students and that is uh, in the Los Angeles area. So I just went ahead and colored the whole state of California red because if they're going, if California as a state is going to allow that to happen in one of their school districts, uh, we're guessing that it's going to happen very quickly in others as, as well. Then moving on to the actual resistance tracker itself. So this was what I briefed last time, and this is uh, these are the updates for now. So compared to last time, we have we have a pretty good idea as to how each state's government and state level enforcement agencies will go when it comes to medical mandates. Uh, again, this map is not perfect by any means. It's not as hard and fast as it might seem, right? It is solely meant to depict, based on all of the information that we have seen, where we think the medical resistance hotspots are when it comes to state-level enforcement attempts. For Nebraska, for instance, I have no idea what's going on with state-level leadership. And here's what I mean. This is an excerpt from a statement posted by Governor Pete Ricketts in which he urges people to get the jab, but in the exact same statement, there are several paragraphs that undermine the shot and talk about how it was rushed into production and the mistrust on the federal level. Uh, maybe I'm reading into this too much or not enough, I, I don't know, but you can read the confusing and seemingly contradictory statement yourself. The link is in the sources at the end of this, but it, it seems that some states are pro-jab but anti-jab mandate. And even within that category, there are states that seem to be anti-mandate, but only because the federal government beat them to the punch and the mandate isn't their mandate. So I honestly don't know what to make of states like Nebraska when it comes to the likelihood of resistance efforts being allowed to grow by state-level leadership. Again, we've got a pretty good idea as to what the citizens of Nebraska think, but when it comes to enforcement agencies specifically, the way this working out is still, it's still disconcerting. Similar situation in Idaho. Uh, I've changed it back from red to orange in the wake of more politicians at the state level organizing a bit better, but the governor is extremely still pro-jab, and he has been doing everything he can to promote it to include striking down a mask mandate ban that the lieutenant governor put forward. So clearly Idaho is, again, one of those weird situations where they recently announced that they might be suing Biden. But when it comes to state-level government, and specifically any potential enforcement agencies, it's a very hesitant resistance that we have little faith in actually being substantial or reliable in the long term. And moving on to international issues, so first up is Kosovo. So border guards in Kosovo have started removing Serbian license plates from vehicles entering Kosovo, stating that they are not recognized as being official. Um, this has increased tensions in the region as the Serbs have started protesting, uh, holding up traffic, and the like. Right now, Serbia and Kosovo are in talks to calm down the situation diplomatically, um, and as far as why this is worthy of mention, this is really just a minor diplomatic spat, but due to the history between these nations and a significant U.S. military presence in Kosovo, it's worth keeping an eye on. Up next is the United Kingdom, so BP has announced that they are having to ration gasoline and diesel for their gas stations in the UK due to the intense driver shortage that is resulting in not enough people to drive their fuel trucks. So this is not exactly a shortage of fuel. Uh, there's plenty of fuel, it's just there's a shortage of drivers that is resulting in a shortage of fuel. Again, this highlights the importance of boring stuff like logistics and how the slightest, seemingly minor problem can snowball to result in widespread disruptions in vastly different areas. Up next is Taiwan. So this past week has seen an increase in Chinese aircraft being flown into Taiwan's air defense identification or interdiction zone. For those that do not understand what this means, China likes to assert their dominance over Taiwan by flying their aircraft kind of near Taiwan's airspace. This gets really complicated when we start to define what airspace actually means, like are we talking an economic exclusion zone, are we talking about a national defense zone, uh, you know, which airspace are we talking about, and other diplomatic stuff like that. But just know that China frequently does this. 
Uh, actually, many other nations do this as well, like the U.S. and Russia frequently do this to each other. But this week, the massive interdiction by over two dozen aircraft is almost certainly in response to Taiwan formally requesting a bid to join the CPTPP trade agreement, which China does not like. Moving on to Australia, so the resistance efforts to their lockdowns and passport controls and things like that are, is definitely heating up in Australia as the demonstrations continue uh, throughout this week. Uh, when it comes to the actual videos we're seeing, we are seeing a trend. Anyone who has a pair of eyes can clearly see the trend that uh, while, yes, it is easy to doctor videos or crop videos in such a way as to paint the Australian police and military in a, in a, in a, in a not good light, uh, what is plain to see, despite uh, the fact that this can happen, is that we're definitely noticing that Australian defense forces and police forces are becoming a lot more violent uh, in their response as the unrest grows. So um, we're starting to see things that are really, really dystopian when it comes to an American perspective of things. And uh, clearly many Australians agree that, that, that it is in fact quite dystopian. So the unrest is continuing. It will likely continue as long as government forces continue to uh, force the mandates. And then finally, moving on to Lithuania, uh, this is an interesting one. So the National Cybersecurity Center, which is nestled underneath the Lithuanian Ministry of National Defense, uh, has conducted an in-depth study of smartphones uh, that are made by three of the most well-known Chinese smartphone manufacturers. Uh, these studies are indicating that the phones will censor themselves. Uh, for instance, uh, there are several words and phrases that are blacklisted and are not allowed to be seen by the user. So if you try to read an article or an email or download an app that has these words and phrases anywhere on it, the phone will actually not allow this content to be seen or downloaded by the user. And this image here on your screen is just a part of that full list of terms and phrases. So, so yeah, we encourage you to take a look at that full report because it's very fascinating to read uh, a lot of these Chinese technological devices just having built-in uh, censorship tools uh, at the, coded into them at the software level, which is very interesting uh, how they're doing this. And considering that companies like Huawei, which is one of the ones that is... Uh, actually named in their report is one of the biggest culprits of this censorship and considering that Huawei was just recently given uh, permission by the U.S. government as we revealed last time that U.S. Uh, Biden administration has given permission for them to import computer chips, uh, semiconductor uh, chips uh, in a time of global shortage. Uh, this gets a little bit more interesting now, doesn't it? So something to keep an eye on. Uh, uh, again, I think that it's probably common sense for people out there. If, if you're looking for a burner phone and if you value anything, uh, anything like privacy, you're probably going to avoid a uh, Chinese uh, state-sponsored company. But it's very interesting to actually see a European nation starting to uh, talk about this stuff. So fascinating stuff all around. So that's pretty much all I've got for today. I know kind of a short day today, but uh, we're probably going to see a lot more stuff pop up over the weekend, and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll meet you back next week with another briefing. Uh, again, thank you to all of our new viewers, and thank you again to all of our uh, enduring viewers that continue to help support us as we uh, try to get these briefs cranked out. So again, if you haven't checked out our other videos, chances are there's going to be some cards up on the screen that you can take a look at and uh, some of the more pertinent videos, and they kind of explain why why... Uh, we have the mentality that we have and why we're approaching certain things a certain way. So there's always a reason for everything, and chances are we've probably explained it somehow or another. But here are your sources for this week. Kind of a lot of sources, uh, considering that uh, a lot of the stuff is, is just holdovers from a few times ago. But um, lots of sources when it comes to uh, the links that we can drop. And again, I, I can't put the links down below in the description box because one, they're too big, and two... Uh, YouTube doesn't like us linking to outside sources, uh, and they have we've confirmed that they uh, they don't let our, our videos get seen by a whole lot of people if we tend to uh, drop those links down below. So again, this uh, the slides for this PowerPoint with clickable links will be available from our Odyssey page, which we can link below. And uh, also, chances are, if you're watching this on Patreon, the slides will be attached to the post. So again, thanks as always, and we will see you next time. And always remember, fight in the shade.